Okay, we are good to go. Good morning, as I said, welcome and happy spring. Uh, welcome to the kickoff event of the fifth annual Tech Week YQG, the region's largest festival dedicated to tech, talent and community. We're kicking things off this morning with the 2022 Technology, Media and Telecommunications Predictions with none other than Duncan Stewart from Deloitte, who is joining us today from Israel. We are thrilled to see so many new and old faces this morning and what is normally and always actually a very highly anticipated annual event and we're just so excited to have Duncan back with us. While this event is virtual, we would like to respectfully acknowledge that the land on which we gather today is the traditional territories of the three fire confederacies of First Nation, comprised of the Adawa, the Ojibwe, and the Patatuami peoples. We are grateful to work, learn, and live in this area. Before we get started this morning, I'd like to thank our title sponsor, someone we'd like to thank as family, Deloitte, along with our event partners, the City of Windsor, Invest Windsor Essex, Soar Innovation, and the Chatham Kent Economic Development. Over the next 60 minutes, you will be provided a deep dive on some of the 19 trends highlighted in this year's 2022 TMT report. From chip shortages, AR regulations, sustainable smartphones, entertainment choices, these are just some of the trends you're going to hear about today. If you have any questions for our speakers, Duncan always leaves lots of time for Q&A, so feel free to ask him anything using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Today's session will be recorded and the slides will be shared with attendees. With that, it is my pleasure to turn things over to Tom Lanou, Senior Manager at Deloitte, to introduce our keynote speaker. Hi, Tom, and take it away. Hey, Yvonne, and hey, everyone. Uh, excited to be part of uh, Tech Week here in Windsor, although virtual today. Uh, indeed, this event has been a hallmark of the partnership between Deloitte and WeTech for a number of years now. I think we're at number nine. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity and, and also for your team for putting this event together this morning. Bit about myself, I help lead Ontario's consumer business, manufacturing, and of course, TMT audit and assurance practice here in Ontario. Born and raised in Windsor, over the years, I've witnessed firsthand the growth uh, of technology enabled companies in the area. And uh, along with the rest of this group, I'm really energized and excited about the future of our region. Across an array of industries, Canada's mid market and private companies have had to tailor their operations amid the uncertainty of the COVID-19 pandemic. This crisis has acceler accelerated the digitalization of nearly every corner of the economy. Deloitte's partnership with WeTech is a testament to our commitment to the Windsor-Essex community, as evidenced by other programs, such as Deloitte's Canada Best Managed Program, which in 2021, I'm thrilled to announce, four of Canada's best managed companies are from right here in the Windsor-Essex region. Deloitte is energized by collaborating with Canadian entrepreneurs and private companies to help them grow and thrive through every milestone. Our storefront of value uh, and programs we offer helping companies uh, include offering uh, consulting on global grants and incentives for R&D activities, audit and assurance services, tax and advisory, and as evidenced by this session, providing deep insights into the marketplace. Deloitte Windsor's GI3 Global Incentives Team, for instance, can optimize the process for identifying and claiming government incentives and is led by Matt Larman here in Windsor, along with the local team of professionals. Whether your growth ambitions are across the county or across the globe, Deloitte is here to partner with you in that journey. Today, I've got the opportunity of introducing my esteemed colleague, our presenter, Duncan Stewart. He is the director of TMT research for the Canadian firm and co-author of the firm's TMT 2022 predictions report. Duncan, as Yvonne mentioned, is in Israel and travels the world presenting the firm's TMT predictions. We're very lucky to have him here today. Duncan, over to you. Thanks, Tom. I started my video. Hi. Uh, greetings to everybody in Windsor, Essex, and may I assume Chatham, Kent as well. Uh, I remember, what was it, four years ago, I remember driving to, to both. Uh, I miss those days. I hope we can do that again next year. I'm just going to 
play with my camera here and there we go, it's a little better. So I'm going to now share my screen. One of the things that Yvonne said was, please ask questions, Duncan will leave time for Q&A at the end. Uh, because of the functionality we have here, please feel free to ask me questions as we go. Uh, I can actually monitor the Q&A and chat windows. I'm just going to try to go full screen here. So I can actually see those. So if you've got questions as we go, that's actually the time to ask them. And it makes it seem a little more interactive and fun. My voice is a little scratchy. Uh, I had a sore throat. Um, please let me know if you need me to speak a little louder or if you want me to hold my, my microphone up. Maybe I'll do that right now. Um, Let's get going. I've got a bunch of topics. I've, I've been presenting down as, as Tom said, I've been presenting in Windsor, Essex, uh, oh gosh, for about a decade now. So I have some cars. I think cars are important, for example. So got lots of stuff there. Let's, uh, let's kind of go through. We have 19 topics this year. I'm only gonna talk about 10 or so uh, this year, uh, but there are others available. So certainly feel free to ask about those in the Q&A. Now, I want to start off with, like, why are we having Tech Week? Why do we care about tech so much? Why do we care about TMT predictions? Back when I started, which was an awfully long time ago in 1990, about 5% of the S&P 500 was made up of tech stocks. As of uh, 2021, the end of the year, it's about 30%. So tech is six times bigger. No, 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 it's much more than that. The world's largest electric vehicle company is obviously in the vehicle section, even though many people consider it a tech stock. Uh, the world's largest cloud provider is over in consumer goods. Uh, the world's largest social network is in fact in something called communication services. When you add up all of the different things that most people think of as technology in some form or another, it actually makes up about 50% of the S&P 500. Why does that matter? Well, because the stock market is a predictor of future value and it's a, it's a leading indicator, it's a bellwether. What the, what the stock market is telling us is the TMT uh, as a sector is roughly as important as every other part of the economy combined. I think we're seeing that. We're seeing that in the chip shortage and the impact it has on the automotive sector, but we are seeing it across the board. Every sector cares about technology today. Now, I am going to get to the chip shortage. It's my second topic, which is a bit of a teaser. I know that <clears throat> many um, automotive manufacturers, uh, supply chain distributors, they're all thinking about what technology should I use for my next generation networking, for my advanced wireless networking. And the one that you're going to hear about over and over and over again is 5G, 5G, 5G. And 5G is great, don't get me wrong. 5G is an amazing technology that uses new radio frequencies and software and hardware to provide higher speeds, greater device densities, uh, lower latency, all kinds of great things inside factories and campuses and uh, warehouses and so forth. But there's another technology out there in addition to 5G and it's called Wi-Fi 6. Wi-Fi 6 uses uh, uh, new frequencies, hardware, software to provide higher speeds and lower latency and greater device density. They're not identical by any means, but they are based on a common platform and actually offer many of the same features. We think it's fascinating, but we actually are predicting that 60% more, two and a half billion Wi-Fi 6 devices will ship this year compared to only one and a half billion uh, 5G. Now, I want to focus on the enterprise market. Deloitte conducted a survey of 437, sorry, 437 global networking executives last year, 2021, and we found out that in all nine countries we studied, um, we are seeing our enterprise clients rolling out Wi-Fi 6 much, much faster than 5G. Now, there's a bunch of reasons for that. One of them is cost. A uh, uh, 5G module is 50 to 100 bucks. A Wi-Fi 6 module can be 5 to 10 dollars. When it comes to deploying these networks, uh, the average auto company has dozens or even hundreds of people who are specialized in deploying uh, Wi-Fi networks, and they don't have people who are de experts at deploying cellular networks. Plus, at least in Canada, there are no frequencies allocated for enterprise use of 5G, so you got to go get those and partner with the telco. Meanwhile, Wi-Fi 6 you can use without any of those sorts of restrictions. But at the end of the day, and this is important, when you look at the various things that companies, uh, automobile factories perhaps, need to do and connect devices, you take a look at what, what 5G does well. 
And those are the bottom ones here. Are there times when you need to connect things that are outdoors or off campus or moving around? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That happens some of the time. But most, 70, 80, 90 percent of the people and devices and machines that I need to connect to my advanced wireless network are in fact indoors on campus and don't move around all that much. Putting that all together, Wi-Fi 6 is as good as or even better than 5G for multiple enterprise applications. There are exceptions, but we see uh, around the world, uh, at least for this year and next, significantly faster adoption of Wi-Fi 6 by enterprises. We'll talk about this a little bit maybe in the Q&A, uh, but before I go any further, I do want to hit point three here. Advanced networking is core to your innovation architecture. Three quarters of the decision makers we surveyed said that advanced wireless can create significant competitive advantage. I'll go even further. I will say right now that the automotive companies and the factories and the supply chains and the warehouses and the distribution centers, that, that companies that do advanced wireless networking well will succeed and those that do it badly will fail to succeed. Looking in the chat window here, um, somebody says, good morning. Okay, I don't think I need to answer that. But do, if you do have questions on this topic or anything else, please do post them in the Q&A. As you can tell, Duncan is monitoring those in real time and uh, always happy to do that. As I said, it makes it much more fun and interactive. Next topic, here we go, chip shortage. Now, <clears throat> All right, chip shortage lasts throughout 2022, into 2023, into 2024. What? Yeah, it's gotten worse. I'll talk more about why. Uh, but we expect the shortage to persist. Um, I should be detailed here. Uh, there are two different ways, basically, of making chips. On a 300 millimeter wafer, that's about 12 inches across, uh, I can make very, very small, uh, high pro advanced process nodes, uh, three, five, seven, 10 nanometer chips. Um, uh, those are the things that you find inside computers, inside smartphones, uh, gaming consoles, uh, data centers. Uh, meanwhile, there are a lot, and I'll get to them in a second, um, there are a lot of chips made on uh, uh, 200 millimeter wafers. Those are about eight inches across. Uh, you, with 75, 100, 150 nanometer feature size, those are trailing edge technologies. Those are 10, 15, 20, 25 years old. Um, there are a lot of them. Hey, Yvonne, I'm going to bug you. If nobody's going to ask any questions, are you there? Can I hear you? I'm here. Great. Here comes my chance to torture Yvonne. So Yvonne, a oh couple weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, the SIA, the Semiconductor Industry Association, disclosed for the first time in years how many chips were made around the world last year. So this is all chips, all kinds. This ranges from chips that cost uh, $2,000 to chips that cost two cents. I want Yvonne to put on your smart hat and guess how many chips do you think were made worldwide, all chips, all industries, last year? Give me a number. Oh boy, oh boy. Um, Everybody um, gets um, this wrong, don't worry about it. Oh boy, uh, I'm gonna say in the billions, one trillion. Well, you're a trillion, okay, you got it. It's 1.15 trillion chips were made last year. Thank you for playing along, Yvonne. Of those 65%, the light blue portion here, were actually those trailing edge chips. Those 65 nanometer and above chips is actually the majority. Not by dollars, this is by units. And those are the chips that you find in refrigerators and robots in factories and, <clears throat> clear as throat, the automotive sector. By and large, the chips that are needed for making cars are in that trailing methodology and and they are in shortage too. Now, why is it lasting until 2024? Here's where it gets complicated. By and large, 22 is sold out, okay? But you know the thing, you know the thing when you're traveling, I'm traveling right now. If I try booking a hotel, uh, I can place my order for a hotel now, and if I pay up front, I get a discount. The chip industry actually works the opposite way around. If you right now put your money down for a non-cancelable, non-recallable order, you will pay now and you will pay a premium and you will never get your money back, but you're locking in supply for 2024. There are a number 
number of companies who in their most recent quarterly conference calls have been saying that they are sold out of those non-cancellable, non-recallable orders through 22, 23, and now even into 2024. Now, if you're an automotive company and you've already locked in your supply for 23 and 24, you won't have a shortage. But if you haven't, you will. And I think that's a, a nuance that many people don't understand. Now, one of the other things we're doing is that 80% or so of chips are made in Asia right now. And that's obviously caused problems with supply chain and COVID and ships getting stuck in canals and fires and droughts and famines and plagues and gosh knows what else. So what could we do to help that? Well, in Europe and in North America, people, governments and companies are spending tens of billions of dollars to build more capacity closer to home. This is called reshoring or localization. I will share with you a conversation that I had with a French CEO uh, almost two months ago now. They said, Duncan, what do you think about the, the European Chips Act? I said, great idea. Build more chips in Europe. They said, Seems like it makes a lot of sense. Will that help us uh, with our supply chain? I said, oh, for sure. They said, will it help us next shortage? And I said, oh, for sure. They said, will it help us if something terrible happens in Asia and like we couldn't get chips from Taiwan anymore? And I laughed and I laughed and I laughed and I said, no. When it comes to the advanced chips that many, many industries need, too much capacity comes from Asia. If something really, really, really bad happens, we can move our dependence, you know, we can make the percentage of chips made in North America go from like 10% to 15. But that still means we need to get 85% from other places. At the end of the day, although localization and reshoring is a good idea, it is, it is not a get out of jail free card. Um, it's terribly difficult for us to become self-sufficient in chips. I don't see it happening in the near term. Before I go any further, somebody is about to ask the question, Duncan, um, what's going on with this whole Ukraine-Russia thing? That doesn't feel like a good thing in general, let alone uh, for the chip industry. It depends. Between 50 and 70% of the world's ultra-pure supplies of neon and krypton gas is used for the lasers that you uh, need in order to make chips. Uh, 50 to 60 to 70 percent of those supplies come from Ukraine. Ukraine has two major plants. Both plants have, in fact, been shut down by the war. Uh, companies have reserves, and that's good, but those reserves last weeks or months. They don't last forever. The chip shortage, I, I know I can't believe this. Nobody, nobody on the call is expecting Duncan to say this, but it's true. I cannot believe I'm saying this, but there is a chance that not only will the chip shortage last, it could even become more severe. Um, things happen in war. Plants get shut, plants get bombed, plants get sabotaged, ships carrying stuff get sunk, get blockaded. There's embargoes, there's sanctions, there's retaliation. Terrible, terrible stuff. Uh, I, I was in Kiev not that long ago, a few years ago, and a wonderful uh, city and people, and I'm really s terribly sad about what's going on there. However, from a global perspective, things could get uh, extremely bad. Um, I'm actually seeing, uh, yeah, there's actually a great question here from uh, Lee Doucet. 1.15 trillion, and it's still hard to get a PlayStation? Absolutely, Lee. You gotta understand, the global chip industry was 400 billion in 2019. It's 600 billion this year. They've actually grown the industry by 50%. The chip shortage we are seeing isn't because people aren't making chips, it's that we haven't grown supply as astonishingly fast as demand has been. Demand for chips is through the roof. So even though the industry is growing and growing well, it's not growing quite fast enough. Uh, Andreas Waller uh, says uh, automotive OEM companies have, in my experience, been reluctant replacing wire harness with a wireless solution for intra-vehicle communications. Do you see this changing with the development of Wi-Fi 6 and cybersecurity? Wow, what an interesting question. I actually don't know. Um, I suspect in a car you might not use Wi-Fi. I think you would be more likely to use other wireless technologies. Uh, this is for in-vehicle communication. However, I am not an expert on that space. I don't know if it would be Wi-Fi 6. There are other technologies such as Bluetooth and LoRa and Sigfox and there are uh, wideband IoT, uh, uh, sorry, narrowband IoT. Um, there's a lot of wireless technologies. I don't know what you would use inside a car. So interesting question. Let's put that one on hold. But great question. Love those. Thanks for bringing them in. Why does the chip shortage matter so much? Because I am old. 
And I remember being a baby analyst that covered a semiconductor company in 1990, and I was looking at the size of the automotive market. And back in the day, 32 years ago, the average car had a few bucks worth of chips in it, most of them in the clock radio. And if you didn't have the chips, you shipped the car and put the clock radio, radio in later. In 2022, the average car has 400 or so dollars worth of chips in it. The average electric car has a couple of thousand. The average high-end car has one to two thousand. And without those chips, you can't ship. Uh, the car doesn't start, drive, turn, brake, or stop. Uh, these are all bad things. Uh, basically, chips are essential within automotive, but many, many other industries as well. Next uh, slide. Hang on, why is this not moving forward? Hello? There we go. Um, what can be done? Now, this is Duncan blowing his own horn. Not only did I write the chip predictions you're hearing from me today, I have also written a bunch of other reports. I wrote something called the Deloitte Semiconductor Outlook, and I wrote a thing called Five Fixes for the Semiconductor Supply Chain. In those, we talk about digital capabilities models, digital transformation, digital supply networks, talent, uh, lots and lots of other things. Please check out the Deloitte website or just email me at the end of this and I'll send you a copy of those reports. Um, they're all vitally important reading uh, for uh, the automotive sector or any other. Now, shifting gears. And I'm probably not even going to get through all of my topics. I wanted to spend a lot of time on chips and this is one of the ones I want to focus on. When you look at the average computer or data center, there are chips inside there. When you look at the average smartphone, there are processors inside there. Those markets, the processor, are closed and proprietary ISAs. That's an instruction set architecture. Uh, inside mobile phones, it's almost always ARM. Inside uh, data centers uh, and computers, it's almost always x86. Those two ISAs are effectively closed and proprietary duopolies. When you, when you use those ISAs, you can tinker with them to a limited extent. You pay money for the designs. You pay royalties for the designs. Um, they have their virtues. They have many, many virtues, but they control like 98% of the market. There is an open, uh, uh, free uh, ISA called RISC V, Reduced Instruction Set Computing V. That the V is the Roman numeral five. Um, we believe this market is doubling year over year. That's conservative. A quarter of new chip designs already use RISC V. Major new chip companies use RISC V. A company that is the leading RISC V company. It's not even on this chart because it happened yesterday. Just raised, I think it was 150 or 250 million dollars. Expected to go public. Uh, uh, valuation was over two and a half billion. And Intel, you've all heard of Intel, uh, the x86 ISA. Intel announced two weeks ago that they are now a premier member of the Risk Five Alliance and will spend a billion dollars a year, sorry, a billion dollars supporting that ecosystem. This is massive, massive stuff. Um, a, a, an open source ISA is free, flexible, easier to modify and sanction free. That matters for China. Who will be using these China startups, AI and oh gosh, Duncan, does that say automotive right there? It says automotive right there. Uh, if you look at the actual prediction, we actually talk about the number of cores going into the automotive market. Um, I would expect to see risk five by 2030 likely dominate the automotive market at, at, at the level of 90% plus. Uh, if you want to know what the future of automotive electronics uh, processors will be, almost certainly Risk v will be a big part of it. Um, pay attention to this one. I, I know it sounds geeky and obscure, but you got to trust me on this one. For, for Windsor Essex, this is going to be a big thing. Next one, um, AI regulation. Yvonne mentioned this in the introduction. I'm just going to scan up. Uh, any more questions? Don't see any. Um, AI, regu AI has historically been lightly regulated. Uh, why? Uh, regulators were afraid of stifling innovation. Well, that's changing. Uh, the EU, US, Canada, lots and lots of regulation coming, lots of uh, fines and obligations and technologies actually being banned. Why? It's all about bias. Let us use an example here. Um, now you can see the quotes. Uh, it's about bias. It's about bias. Um, can I come up with a real world example? Okay, this is, I've never done this live. I hope this doesn't go wrong. One of the problems with AI is it's bad on, for example, uh, race. 
and uh, it's it's distracted by uh, ability, uh, ableism. Um, it, it, it's not good at. So let, let's come up with an example. Let's say you have a self-driving vehicle. Uh, which is good at spotting white people, but bad at spotting people of color. Uh, does that mean it might potentially be biased and more likely to uh, break more aggressively for white people than people of color? I'm making this up, but it is a it is a real example. This is an actual thing. AIs are less good at recognizing non-white people due to training data and bias. AI does not eliminate human bias. AI does not reflect human bias. AI amplifies human bias. Could this be a factor in self-driving? Absolutely. Um, pay, not, pay attention to this one. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be important. Regulators are all over this. Um, uh, why does why does all that matter? Uh, AI does not reflect human bias. It amplifies it. It does so literally at the speed of light, billions of times per second in a non-transparent, non-auditable way. In other words, the only way, perhaps the only way we would discover that AIs, for example, were failing to recognize people of color uh, compared to white people would be after we start noticing that self-driving cars are killing uh, people with darker skin. Like I'm, I'm not trying to be insensitive here. I'm trying to give you a very, very real example of problems that AI machine learning has had in other ways and trying to apply it to your industry. So obviously this one matters a lot. Uh, uh, public sector financial services and HR all matter. Uh, cloud gets into some interesting stuff there, uh, but certainly this is one I would flag. Um, uh, the example of recidivism, uh, that's a great example from Lee Doucette. Yeah, uh, now that's not, I don't know how that would apply necessarily to the auto sector, but that would be one of the public sector ones, Lee. What happens is that AIs have a very strong tendency to deny black people probation where they give white people probation, where they uh, you know, talk about probable cause and investigations and so forth. That's the public sector kind of stuff. Uh, that's once again because of the machine learning uh, training data being biased and that bias ends up being ampl amplified. Thanks, Lee. Perfect example. Okay, now I have some good news. There's actually some stuff you can do uh, about privacy and security in when using AI. Now, this gets a little geeky, but uh, I'm going to flag this one. I don't know that this is necessarily of key interest in Windsor Essex, but it's an important technology, and I'll explain why in a second. Two technologies out there, one called homomorphic encryption. Normally, when you want to do AI uh, learning, you need to decrypt the data first, and obviously, it's vulnerable when you do that. Homomorphic encryption allows you to do machine learning on data while it's still encrypted, which is pretty cool and also, obviously, significantly more private and secure. Federated learning, um, I have a phone here, it's a Google Pixel, it's kind of hard to see there, but there you go. Um, and, and on my phone, I have a little chip, that chip called the Tensor AI, uh, that chip actually does all of the AI machine learning, uh, my location, my voice, my payments, my videos, my images, uh, all that stuff. All of that stuff is processed locally on my phone. Only the results, encrypted and hashed, are in fact sent uh, uh, off to Google or other places in the cloud. So um, uh, federated learning is another approach. It's still a fairly small market, both of these. Why is Duncan talking about this? Gosh, why indeed? Because the companies that are already, the companies who have publicly stated they are using a either homomorphic encryption or federated learning include Apple, Google, Microsoft, NVIDIA, IBM, DARPA, Intel, Oracle, MasterCard, Scotiabank, Deloitte, uh, Meta, uh, lots and lots out there. Keep an eye on this one. I know it's a bit geeky, but um, definitely I think one of the more interesting topics from this year. Uh, skip over that one. Wearable technologies. This is kind of a fun one. Deloitte's predicting that the number of wearable devices used for monitoring uh, serious medical conditions uh, will be 320 million this year. Um, that's growing at uh, about 10% a year for the smart watches, nearly 20% a year for smart patches. What's a, what's a smart patch? Um, see this little bottle cap here? It's something I would ah, wear. It would be like on the back of my arm or maybe on my chest. I would wear it for a day or two or maybe a couple of weeks. Um, and and um, that smart patch is smaller, but growing really, really rapidly, um, worth billions of dollars, medical grade. What do I mean by medical grade? 
Historically, smartwatches have been used for counting your steps or how well are you sleeping or what's your heartbeat. Those are fine and those are good ways of monitoring the health of otherwise healthy people. They are not good for measuring uh, serious medical conditions such as hypertension, high blood pressure, uh, low blood oxygenation as a result of COVID or long COVID, um, uh, low blood sugar too high, too low for tens of millions of diabetics worldwide, or measuring heart rhythms for people who suffer from a condition called atrial fibrillation, AFib, a major cause of stroke. What is going on is that these smart patches, these smart watches are going through medical trials and are demonstrating substantial equivalence to other traditional forms of monitoring these diseases and are being used by literally millions of people to monitor their health. Why? Because monitoring blood sugar or blood pressure or blood oxygen or atrial fibrillation, monitoring these things 24 by 7 is better than monitoring them once a week or once a month when you're in the doctor's office. Um, these are important growing uh, technologies worth billions. There are some barriers, doctor skepticism, integration into patient records and workflows, uh, devices need to be kept uh, uh, private and secure, um, consent, employers, all that kind of stuff. Uh, lots of lots of stuff to unpack here, but really interesting, fascinating market. Uh, just as an example, at both CES and Mobile World Congress this year, uh, January and March, for the first time ever, healthcare companies are giving keynotes at those conferences about smart, uh, smart patches and wearable health. So hot growing market. Now, as a result of the pandemic, uh, and most of you know this, as a result of the pandemic, we are seeing, uh, they call it a, an epidemic of mental health, uh, depression, anxiety, much more. We are saying that mental health apps are a half billion at least market, perhaps much larger than that, growing at high double digits. Uh, uh, you can read the numbers here. Why does it matter? Two reasons. Uh, one of them is that adding a mental health app to traditional uh, medical therapy, talk therapy, drug therapy, significantly improves the outcomes for patients. It's like the third leg of a stool. Um, having a device that's with you 24 by seven is a good thing. It can remind me, remind you to take your medicine, see your therapist, do your breathing exercises, whatever, whatever is required, it can do. So that's a good thing. The other thing is, and this is probably not so much in Windsor, Essex as it is uh, India. I did a, I did a webinar just like this one for our Indian firm, and my my Indian colleague uh, Pian Sudarshan said, "Duncan, you don't understand. You, you, you just like you just don't get it. Here in India, we've got like we've got 0 0.03 therapists per hundred thousand people. There's just this tremendous lack of psychiatrists and psychologists and so forth in India. He says, that's, that's, that's the first part of the problem. The second part of the problem is that they are only in cities. And if you're outside a city, you just, there's nobody to go to. And the third, and, and this is him talking, not me. He said here in India, there's a tremendous stigma around seeking help for mental health. Uh, he says it shouldn't be that way. Of course it shouldn't. We, I disagree completely with this, but I got to be realistic. Sudarshan said it's there. He said he believes these mental health apps in developing world markets such as India, where there's too little, uh, too few therapists and, and strong social stigma. He said this could be a vastly more important and larger market than we think in this one. Um, I, I did the same presentation in Turkey and they said exactly the same thing. So uh, keep your eye, keep your eye on that one. Obviously issues around uh, monetization. A lot of these apps are not being priced right yet, but I think that'll happen over time. Um, uh, you do want to worry obviously about privacy security. Uh, these are, this is sensitive information, uh, but uh, definitely a market that I am keeping my eye on. I'm just looking up here, no questions. Okay, well, we'll have time. Kind of a bit of a change of pace. I wanna spend a second talking about the media sector, specifically around books. Believe it or not, and I just did an interview on this, uh, book sales have done really well during the pandemic. They were up, I think in the US 12% last year, which is one of the best. And that's that includes that includes audiobooks. Audiobooks were up even more, about 14%. So book sales really were really robust. But the problem is, that men and boys 
don't read as much as girls and women, and they don't read books by and about girls and women, and that leads to two problems. The first problem is that because men and boys, especially because boys don't read as much, there's a reading gap. Uh, there's one around the world, uh, multiple, con I think this is 23 countries. That's uh, true in Canada as well. Uh, there's a significant reading gap over time. If we want our sons to read better, we need to encourage them to read more books. Um, that's fine. That's actually not the big problem. The big problem, and I know this personally, Yvonne knows this story. Uh, years ago, my daughter came to me and said, Dad, I love you. You read books. You read books to us. You buy us books for Christmas. Have you ever noticed you read almost entirely books by men? I was like, I would never do. And I looked at my bookshelf and I was like, crap, she's right. Since then, Caitlin bought me a bunch of books by women, by female authors. Um, and, and, and since then, I have, in fact, read nothing but books. I'm at 390-some now. Um, I have read nothing but books by women, and it, it's the scales have fallen through my eyes. I just finished reading a book about what it's like to be a uh, French-speaking uh, Muslim lesbian in France. And it was like, I, I, how would Duncan know what that felt like if I don't read a book? In general, books are this magic machine that allows us to see the world through somebody else's eyes, to walk a mile in their shoes, uh, high heels perhaps. Um, I would really argue, this sentence here says it, reading fiction can strengthen various capabilities, including emotional intelligence, empathy, and imagination, all of which are in high demand in the workplace. If we continue to allow our sons to not read books by and about women, we are harming them in terms of their future work experience, but also their living experience. Uh, empathy is a good thing in many, many different ways. I'm ranting here, but I know this works. Since my daughter gave me those books, since I've read only books by women, my son has started reading more books by women. So, I mean, it works, okay? Um, lots here to do. Where do I think the onus lies on the dads? It's up to us to read in front of our kids, to read in front of our sons, to read to our sons, and to read books uh, by and about women um, and diversity in general uh, as much as we possibly can. Writers of color, uh, different languages, cultures, races, sexual identities, all that kind of stuff. Speaking, hang on, I see there's some questions here in the chat. Uh, what's the best book I read in 2021? Yvonne, I've actually got a post where I tried narrowing it down to my top 21 for 2021, and I came up with 37 books. So uh, I can't come up with one. There's a bunch. It's uh, on my LinkedIn profile. Uh, love them all. There's just, you know, but they, I, I read so many books. I read about 130, 140 books a year. Um, uh, there, there's a ton. Uh, what would be one that, that, that jumped out at me? Um, I'd have to, I'd have to go. There we go. Thanks, Yvonne. You put that up. Uh, don't force me to recall 38 books in real time. Next topic that I want to want to deal with is women in the tech industry. Now, historically, technology companies have been poor at employing women. One would think during the pandemic, when women's participation in the labor force suffered across all industries, that they did a bad job. Wrong. Wow. Really impressively. Over the last three years, we actually believe that the largest, this is the 20 largest technology companies in the world, uh, huge, massive companies have actually done a decent job of growing their female workforce up a couple points in terms of overall workforce up two and a half points for women in technical roles and up a remarkable and hats off four points 4.1 actually uh 4.1 percentage points in terms of women in leadership roles they are hiring women they're hiring technical women and they are promoting women that's the good news i'm really pleased about that we still have a long way to go before parity don't get me wrong but at least we are heading in the right direction for now. Next slide. Deloitte conducted a survey of thousands of women across all industries. It was called Women at Work. And this is a slice where we looked at just the women in TMT. We asked questions to rank aspects of their life, good or extremely good, both uh, before the pandemic and uh, in the middle of 2021. When it came to work-life balance, women said that their work-life balance, 70% had been good or extremely good. That fell by more than half to 32. Mental well-being, more than half to 31. 51% of women in TMT feel less optimistic about their career prospects with an 
absolutely shocking 57. Nearly six out of 10 saying they expect to leave their employer for a new role within two years. It is great that the TMT industry is doing a better job attracting women. There are significant concerns around retention. You know, you can you can you can hire the women, but can you keep them? Uh, real challenge there. What can be done? Uh, broader talent pool, recruit from over little segments. That's that's all good start. But as we say here, retention and promotion are going to be the key things you can do. Gender bias is the top obstacle preventing tech women from moving into leadership positions. So there you go. Um, I see we've got a question here in the Q&A. Maybe uh, where is the music industry going? Hey, Michael, I'm going to take this one uh, at the end if you don't mind, uh, just because it, it is not a lower priority topic. It's just one that I'm going to deal with at the end, if that's okay with you. Okay, so games console, speaking of the media industry, mobile's bigger. Mobile's over twice as big as gaming, as, as, as console gaming. Uh, mobile's growing faster, probably growing about twice as fast. However, Game console market is 22 billion in hardware, nearly 60 billion in software, titles, subscriptions, and in-app payments. Subscriptions, I mentioned, yeah. Um, Game Pass, stuff like that. Uh, revenues per console player uh, are the highest, $92 per. Nearly a billion people playing consoles, $80 billion ecosystem, growing at 10% a year. The recent acquisition acquisition of Activision Blizzard for $70-ish billion, biggest acquisition in tech history. Uh, gaming consoles will be one of the portals to the metaverse, which I'll be talking about shortly. Uh, it's it's i'm not saying it's more important than mobile i'm saying just don't forget about it don't neglect it eh um what's going on there lots of power lots of chips shortages as we discussed uh, yeah imagine how much bigger this industry would be if we didn't even have shortages right lots of growth in subscriptions we see that being 11 billion dollars a year in, in you know gaming as a service uh, uh by 2025. One thing, uh, uh, virtual currency, flag that one. That's going to matter a lot for the metaverse. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, what would I flag here? Uh, uh, things like uh, Stadia and gaming in the cloud, possible, not not disruptive yet. People are still using consoles, still 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 preferring the console experience. One day, I'm sure that the the true gaming in the cloud, 100 percent of the time, thing will happen. But for now, uh, consoles are not going away. And to repeat myself, portal, metaverse, we'll talk more about that in a minute. I see there's another question here in the Q&A. Uh, no, sorry, in the chat. Uh, you talked about wearables and now consoles. Uh, yeah, so there's a question here about, uh, this is from Yvonne, uh, talking about the future of VR and metaverse. Yvonne, I've got some slides at the end, so I'll be talking about the metaverse then. Okay, next uh, next topic. Maybe it's the metaverse. No, not yet. Want to spend a second here. Hang on, I went the wrong way. Want to spend a second here. Just I I I know Windsor Essex. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of cars. Maybe less TV shows, but I do want to talk about video on demand and video on demand churn. We've got some really great data here. Want to drill through this one? I'm going to slow down. I've been kind of talking kind of fast. Let's let's take it easy for a second. Around the world, more people have video on demand services. Uh, around the world, churn seems to be high and rising. Let me do an unpack on that one. Years ago, I was asked, Duncan, how many video on demand services do you think people will want? I was like, well, what do you mean? He said, well, like nobody wants 500 services. I went, no, no, that's too many. And most people want more than one. And I said, yeah. And they said, well, what's the number? And I said, I don't know, somewhere between one and 500. We actually start to have some numbers on this. This is uh, data from Omdia showing that prior to the pandemic, the uh, average US home had about six VOD services, and it rose through seven to almost eight, and then it started plateauing and declining. Do we have our first hint that the magic number for uh, an upper limit, a ceiling, if you will, on VOD services is seven at the same time, seven or eight, makes sense. Um, where this gets so interesting is that as a result of the pandemic, the number of services in the UK and Brazil and Mexico and stuff like that is soaring, and they're starting to get awfully close to that six, seven, eight number, uh, which suggests that we should be seeing churn rise in multiple G. Oh, look, 
Here's data showing that churn is rising. Now, this data is very recent. This came out on February 28th, and it shows that churn is rising in the United States. But I do want to flag, this is uh, this is a blended number, includes Netflix, and Netflix has quite low churn, about 2.3%, 2.2%. If you excluded Netflix, the churn for premium uh, subscription video on demand is well over 6 and possibly closer to 7 or 8% per month that's monthly churn duncan that number can't be right that that can't be right duncan you you got you've lost your mind here take a look at q3 take a look at q4 in uh q let's let's take a look at q3 in q3 um there were 10.5 million new svod premium subscriptions in the us 10.5 10.5 million new services yes that's the net Gross, there were nearly 38 million new subs and 27, over 27 million cancels. Net, that's 10, but actually there's nearly 40 and nearly 30 million ads and subtracts. So you got to really look at the gross numbers. It wasn't quite as bad in Q4, but, but I expect this to keep going up. Churn is the new normal, just massive, massive. These are incredible numbers. One of the things we're seeing in the States is what we call churn and return. This is a thing, a quarter of all Americans have canceled a service and then resubscribed within 12 months. And when we look at younger people, oh my goodness, 34, 47% of Gen Z and millennials are churning and returning. Um, I have Nordic, uh, sorry, Scandinavian data here. Um, I'll walk you through this one. This is for 18 to 24 year olds. So about uh, 32 to 35% have added a service only. Uh, 15 to 12 are canceling services and not planning on coming back. 14% are doing that churn and return thing with another 22 and 20% of them canceled, but have not yet resubscribed. There's actually a name for this. Uh, Yvonne, I'm going to pick on you on this one. Sorry, uh, you're there. Uh, I, I'm just curious. Do you happen to be uh, uh, somebody who uh, watches The Mandalorian? I am not. <laughs> oh, darn. Do you have any friends who are who, who have kids? I do. I do. My sister has children. Yeah, there you go. So see, there's a thing. If you've got uh, Disney Plus and you watch The Mandalorian and you're an adult and you watch The Mandalorian and you're tired of it at the end and you've watched all the episodes and you want to cancel it, you can't because your daughter wants to watch Frozen for the 7,093rd time. Is this correct, Yvonne? It is very correct. There we go. I, I know what's going on in the Pilon household. Um, maybe that's not your sister's last name. You know what I meant. The point being, for people out there who don't have kids, a whole bunch of them are watching The Mandalorian, binging it, and then dropping the service until new episodes come on. There's actually a name for this in Hollywood. They call it the Mandalorian effect. And it's not just the Mandalorian and it's not just Disney. This is a thing we are seeing across all kinds of video on demand services. What can you do? Well, there's different kinds of models, like including advertising. What else can you do? Well, you can partner. So I got some fun slides here. This is uh, once again from that February 28th data. Um, I put this slide up uh, here in Israel. Oh gosh, what day is today? Monday? One, a little over a week ago, I put this slide up and I said, as you can see, there are all kinds of video on demand services out there. Some of them uh, have ads and some of them don't like Apple and Disney and Netflix. Uh, but it looks like that ad thing is growing and more and more companies are going to have ads. Maybe not Netflix, but maybe some of the others. The next day, Disney Plus announced it's introducing an ad support and video on demand service at a reduced price. So like, I wish I'd predicted that. Uh, oh, wait, I did. Um, next thing I want to talk about is partnering. Uh, a lot of people probably on this call are very, very familiar with subscribing to Netflix. And you know, you just do that. You get Netflix or you get Apple TV direct. However, a lot of other services come through distribution channels. And those can include all the ones you see here and not on this chart, but there's also distribution through cable companies and telco. So lots and lots of partnering going on. This is me. Uh, many people, I'm looking at the time, I am more or less exactly on time here. Uh, many people ask me, Duncan, can I subscribe to your newsletter? Duncan does not have a newsletter. Please follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Uh, that's where I publish my articles. Not so much in the last week. I've been kind of busy, but normally I do. Um, uh, Trevor uh, asked a question on NFTs. Um, I'm going to answer that one in a second, and I'm seeing in the Q&A. Okay, so chat. 
So let me talk about NFTs right now. We actually have a prediction, Trevor, on NFTs this year. We were looking mainly at the sports market. NFTs are non-fungible tokens, and they're a way of making a digital artifact like a video clip or a JPEG or any an audio file, any kind of digital artifact, making a unique version that you can own and trade and buy and sell and display. We're predicting that market for sports will double this year. Uh, you know, if you're a Detroit Tigers fan, uh, going out there and getting a clip of your favorite player or highlight, uh, if you're watching the Red Wings, uh, Lions, I mean, I can't picture anybody collecting anything from the Lions. I'm kidding. I'm teasing my friend Yvonne, who I know, happen to know, goes to Lions games. Uh, but when you're, when you're looking at sports, we are seeing the market for sports NFTs, non-fungible tokens, doubling year over year to two billion. Four to five billion fans will be buying, selling, collecting, and trading these. Uh, we see it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The season hasn't even begun. I shouldn't pick on the Lions. Uh, but um, but uh, uh, we're uh, we see a big market in NFTs, and once again, really important for the metaverse. So, Duncan, why don't you talk to us about the metaverse? Here we go. What is the metaverse? Metaverse is a thing where I go online into a virtual world. I have virtual currency where I can buy and sell and collect and trade and speculate on things and display things. I have friends. So I talk to my friends. They are avatars. I am avatars. Uh, we socialize. We play games. We flirt. We go to concerts. We watch things. It's a, it's a whole ecosystem. And everybody on the phone who's got kids is going like, Duncan, this, this exists. This is called Roblox. This is called Minecraft. This is called World of Warcraft. This kind of thing has been happening for years and i'm like yes they have but those are mini verses those are sliver verses those are the problem is that my avatar what i look like in one of those the things i buy my social graph my friends and what they look like my experiences my currency all of it is utterly non-portable and locked inside a walled garden. That is not the metaverse Neil Stevenson was discussing in Snow Crash in his 1992 book. In 1992 book Snow Crash, you are in the metaverse and you have all of that stuff and you get on a monorail and you go somewhere else and your money is still good. Your shoes are still on your feet. Your friends are still your friend. You are you. Your username is you. Your user interface is you. It's consistent across multiple places. Right now, we don't have that. We have a bunch of mini verses. Now, I'll talk about this in a second, okay? Uh, why does all this matter? Uh, smartphone sales have been flat for about the last four years. Um, companies are investing billions of dollars in this space from Facebook slash Meta to uh, Microsoft. Uh, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley say this is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. Now, none of this is official Deloitte thought leadership. We are working on a prediction on the metaverse for publication on, I think it's December 2nd, and we will have something for you and tune back in then. This is Duncan's back of the envelope, quick thoughts, because people won't stop asking me questions about the metaverse. So here we go. Now, Deloitte has a thing called, uh, uh, what is it? unlimited reality or something like that, digital reality, un unlimited reality or something like that. <clears throat> it's about enterprise metaverses. And we are doing training, onboarding, digital twins, plant tours, audits, all that kind of, and all of a sudden, remember I talked about that whole thing about it's a silo and it's a walled garden. What was a problem, that's not a bug, that's a feature. The fact that I can run a Deloitte training session and nobody who isn't from Deloitte can see it. Nobody can leave. They can't take anything out. They can't bring anything in. That's actually a really good thing. I think in this current miniverse kind of world we have right now, I actually think the enterprise metaverse market is a really interesting one. I see a lot of ways in which enterprise market for the metaverse could take off this year, next year. Now that's not the $8 trillion. When it comes to consumers, you've got a problem. You got, well, you may have, a, well, first of all, you got the walled garden problem. Until we solve that, I think, I, I think it fails to take off, except in a niche way. The second thing is there's this huge debate do I need VR goggles? So Deloitte does a survey of 35,000 people across 15 countries every year. We did it again this last year, 2021. And something like 90% of people uh, use their smartphones daily. 50, 60% of people use their smart TV sets daily. 
Uh, something like 10% of people use consoles, gaming consoles daily. I, I don't mean 10% of people have consoles use them daily. 10% of the overall population uses a console within the last day, one in 10, it's not a small market. The percentage of people out there who have VR goggles is about 10%, percentage. it hasn't moved in a few years. Uh, the percentage of people out there who uh, have used their VR goggles in the last day is about 10%, and 10% times 10% is 1%. It's actually slightly less. Fewer than 1% of the people we have surveyed around the world have used VR goggles in the last day. Uh, this is a problem. Yes, there are new manufacturers coming, and yes, they get cheaper and better and lighter and so forth. But at the end of the day, they are still heavy, uncomfortable, nauseating things that most consumers, not all, but most consumers really hate. My view, my early view, is that there will be a VR market for the metaverse, but I don't think it's dramatically larger than the current VR market. I think there are people out there who want VR goggles and will wear them in the metaverse. But one of the things I keep hearing is, oh, you need those to be immersive. Barbara, my wonderful and beautiful and accomplished and intelligent wife, has a problem with me. She wants to get my attention and I'm reading a book and she has to whack me over the head with a baseball bat because Duncan scary, staring at a chunk of dead tree with ink on it is fully immersed in what goes on. And you know, people watching TV are actually, you ever watch somebody in their favorite horror movie, cinema, radio, podcasts, music. We, you know what the most powerful VR device in the world is? It's your brain and your imagination. People can become entirely captivated and entranced on flat 2D screens of all kinds. And I do not believe VR goggles are a sine qua non. They, they, they are not a must have for the metaverse to take off. I believe the dominant portal for the metaverse, if and when it occurs, will be smartphones, computers, tablets, TVs, uh, consoles. Uh, have I missed anything? Probably not smartwatches, too small. So that's kind of my high level view. Um, okay, I see that Colin McMahon here has, uh, he says exactly more or less what I said. Uh, thanks, Colin, uh, I, I agree. Uh, enterprise is different. I, I believe that there are enterprise applications, digital twins, factories, and so forth, uh, where you maybe want VR goggles. Uh, but uh, I agree at the consumer level, I just don't see the goggles. Now, Michael did ask a question. Thank you, Michael, uh, about music. Where's the music industry growing? Interestingly, physical is doing surprisingly well for the first time ever. Vinyl sales in the United States, not ever, sorry, for the first time since 1985. Vinyl sales in the U.S. alone surpassed a billion dollars. Globally, it's probably a close to $2 billion market. That said, streaming remains uh, a big chunk of it. Streaming is bigger, more important. Uh, we see a lot of growth there. Uh, I see continued fights between the streaming services and artists. I, I, I don't think that tension goes away anytime soon. Radio, um, flattish, but not collapsing. That's kind of good news. A lot of people thought that radio would, would kind of die uh, if people were working from home because they weren't in cars. Turns out people listen to radio even when they're not in cars, which is kind of good news. Uh, that, that, that has implications for the music business. In person and live music, I think that's going to be huge. I think a lot of us are, I'll just share an experience. I'm here in Europe uh, right now, well, Israel, and um, I just saw that the Rolling Stones announced a concert tour across Europe. And uh, at least on, on you know the people I follow, almost everybody is like, I don't care what the tickets cost. I will pay anything to go to a live concert at this point. So I would expect a boom year as a result of pent up demand for live music. Um, hopefully, uh, that's not just the Stones. They mix got enough money already, right? Uh, I am optimistic that that will trickle down to new and growing artists as well. Uh, streaming. Haven't got great answers on that one. As you know, the economics there are you need to be Taylor Swift before you make money at streaming. And that's that's just tough. That's just tough. Don't know what to answer on that one. Uh, I'm looking at the chat. Um, what are we seeing here? Future of of walk. Uh, I'm assuming that's a typo unless Yvonne is asking me questions about my uh, Asian cooking skills. Uh, what trends do I see coming and going? Uh, will talent continue to disperse? More flexibility, four-day work week. Yeah, Yvonne, I think you're seeing a lot of the same things that I'm seeing. 
probably hybrid, not for everybody. Some companies are going to try to force people to come back five days a week. We'll see on that one. My own guess is that uh, some sort of hybrid model, three, four days a week at work, two, three days uh, at home, hybrid, set your own hours, but they are going to want us to come in and meet in person. Uh, I think, I think, uh, I think full work from home, pretty rare, pretty rare. But I do think relatively few office-based employees will be expected to work by five, five days a week. I, I just, I think it's too hard to fit that genie back in the bottle. Um, what are my thoughts on the EV market? Uh, big, growing, uh, unfortunately, lower in North America. Um, Europe and Asia are well ahead of us. I hope we catch up. Uh, pure EVs, uh, even hybrids in North America, half to a quarter of the rates we're seeing in Asia and Europe. Um, I've got to be cautious on this one. Um, North Americans, and I say this as somebody who travels the world, North Americans are unnaturally attached to very, very large vehicles, are unnaturally attached to gas uh, internal combustion vehicles of various kinds. Um, I do see real cultural differences. Uh, this is, you know, a lot of things have become political and partisan. There are a lot of people in North America who actually believe that battery vehicles are like a communist conspiracy, like fluoride in the drinking water, and are resistant, resisting the move to electric vehicles. I think that's a shame. Um, I am optimistic longer term on electric vehicles. Uh, but I, I, I do want to be cautious here that there are significant parts of the North American market that are as opposed, I mean, there's a plague going around, you should get a vaccine. There are a significant percentage of North Americans who did not get vaccines, even though, at least in my view, it was relatively obvious that it's the right thing to do. So uh, never underestimate the ability of people to uh, um, believe things that, that they believe because they want to. Um, okay, I'm looking here, uh, not seeing a lot of other additional questions in the chat, just some commentary back and forth, Billy Joel, love that, uh, but uh, uh, I'm not gonna, not gonna sing anything here. Okay, I am showing we are just a little over half past the market, uh, half past the hour. Uh, I do don't wanna blow up my voice, I've got another webinar later today. Um, I'm going to pause there and I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen. Hi, everybody. Uh, any other questions? I see no open questions. I see nothing in the chat. Um, I'm happy to wrap up slightly early. Yvonne, uh, any other questions from you or anybody else? I mean, I have lots of questions, Duncan. I was happy you answered the metaverse, um, the NFT stuff. I'm curious about big tech, right? The, the you know, consumers pushing for trust, right? Will this be the year where big tech gets the hammer brought down on them? Uh, I mean, fairly obviously, as a Deloitte person, I got to be somewhat careful answering that question. <laughs> Do I see continued regulation? Yes. Do I think that it will be the hammer brought down on them? Maybe. Why am I being slightly more cautious about this from where I would have weirdly if you take a look in North America and in Europe, tech was seen largely as acting like the bad person in the room. They were doing bad and terrible things. They were circulating disinformation. They were propping up bad people and spreading bad stories and generally seen as a harmful thing for society. I have seen in the last month a fairly remarkable shift. The big tech platforms have behaved in, this is not Deloitte. Okay, ignore the Deloitte logo behind me. Okay, Tom is freaking out in the background. This is Duncan's view as a person who monitors social media, but more importantly, is here in Europe, in Israel right now. So I'm not in North America, okay, Vaughn? I am looking at kind of how people are talking about the big tech platforms, which tend to be American companies. And they're looking at how they've handled Russia and how they've handled Ukraine and how they've handled the conflict. And by and large, big tech is getting five gold stars from nearly everybody. They have, in a month, moved the needle on rehabilitating their image in ways that I don't think I even could have imagined a year ago. And I say that as somebody who writes about this issue. 
will they still face regulatory scrutiny around privacy and content moderation and antitrust and blah, 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 blah. Oh, 100%. But I suspect that scrutiny will be less negative than it would have been, uh, I would have predicted a year ago. Interesting question. I hadn't thought that through, but I, 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 uh, you know, what's that thing, your finger in the wind? I really have a sense about that. And you, did you end up going to CES? Did you say you'd ended up going? I was there virtually. I was scheduled to virtually, go in person, okay. and, uh, but I ended up hanging out all day and doing all the virtual nonsense. So Apple, are they going to make a car? No idea. No view. No view. Okay. All right. Um, I don't see any more questions, but as Duncan mentioned, uh, he is very accessible. Um, great. Again, follow him on LinkedIn. We'll be sharing his slides, the TMT report, as well as the recording today. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for, for joining us. And again, for the longstanding partnership with Deloitte, I, I can say that as uh, employee number one of WeTech over 10 years ago, um, it's been a great relationship and it continues to to, to bring Dunk into the region and to share opportunities like the, the Fast 50, for example. Um, so again, thank you so much for all your great questions. Um, and I'm sure you're gonna think of more after. So again, make sure you connect with Duncan on social media. Uh, Duncan, thank you so much again for joining us virtually uh, from Israel. Uh, we hope your, your throat uh, feels better in the very near future. And uh, I'm not sure what where's next but uh, safe travels. And we do hope that in 2023, we can see you in person here in Windsor-Essex can, can continue. Um, I think everyone is yearning to be back in person. And I, again, Tom, I, I hope to see you uh, again very soon. Um, before we say goodbye, a few uh, quick announcements. Again, I just want to reiterate that you're going to get a copy of the slide, the video recording, and the link to the report uh, in a follow-up email later this week, which is going to give you kind of a summary of all of the takeaways for the 2022 Tech Week YQG. We do have a survey for you. We want to know how you enjoyed today's session. It helps us better plan for future sessions and it helps Duncan too. Um, so we're gonna put a quick link in the chat. Again, this is a very, 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 very quick survey promise. Um, and if you can fill it out, it would be greatly appreciated. And Tech Week has only just begun. There is a week long of activities. We talked about uh, uh, NFTs and blockchain and crypto. We have the co-founder of Ethereum joining us on Wednesday. Anthony Diorio will be talking about crypto blockchain as well as kind of what's next for him and uh, the perfect formula for founders and leaders. Uh, tomorrow we have Tech Women. So we're doing an actual really awesome Canada US virtual networking event for women in tech and women entrepreneurs. Happy to hear Duncan that things are a little bit on the rise for women in tech, something I'm very, very passionate about. Um, and you can check out the whole agenda, www.techweek.yqg, and I'll have my team put that in the chat for the for those joining us today. And lastly, please keep an eye out on social media all week long because we are going to be announcing the 2022 Tech Award winners. These are the unsung heroes in technology in Windsor, Essex, and Chatham, Kent, and we'd love for you to join us in celebrating them. That concludes today. I just want to say thank you again. Enjoy the uh, beautiful day wherever you are. Um, Duncan, again, please say hi to Deborah or Tepra. Please say hi to Barbara for me. Um, and again, safe travels. And again, thank you to Deloitte and uh, our partners, Invest Windsor Essex, Chatham Kent Economic Development, Soar Innovation, and the City of Windsor. Enjoy the rest of your day.